Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I just want to start off because uh, I know that everybody are practically tired, I think, right now, uh, with a small question. How many people are from the field of uh, like development, develop coders, uh, software engineers in general? Awesome. And how many people come from the operations side, DevOps? Okay, a few. And security researchers maybe also. Awesome, so we've got a kind of diverse audience, so it's really, really good. I think probably everybody will gain something. And uh, we'll talk about our journey at Panarays, basically for the Kubernetes way, how we handled our use case and problem, and uh, solved it with uh, some Python tools and also using the orchestration of Kubernetes. So mostly because it's a cybersecurity talk, uh, we have to have a hoodie. So once we have that out of our system, we can begin. Um, some important things about this talk. Uh, what I'm not and what Tal is not also, a Docker and Kubernetes expert. And what you won't be after this talk is a Docker and Kubernetes expert. What you will be after this talk is happier people because I've stopped talking. And also you'll know about our problem and the way that we actually solved it with the tools that we're going to talk about. And you will also, of course, know uh, where to search and what, where you can actually learn more things. And of course, you will know the meaning of life. Uh, a bit about myself. So my name is Demi Benari, as presented. Uh, I'm the VP R&D and co-founder of Panarays. Uh, I'm also a Google developer expert, which means basically that Google certified me that I talk a lot. Uh, I'm the co-founder of some developer communities, uh, big things that is focused in big data, data science, and DevOps, and Google Developer Group of Cloud. Guess what? It's focused in cloud. Uh, and in the past, I was a senior data, data engineer at Windward, and also in, I was eight years in the Israeli Air Force, uh, where I actually developed a missile defense system. Hi, everyone. My name is Tal Peretz. I'm a data scientist at Panoways. And if you want to know more about me, you can just scan this unproportionally huge barcode. <laughs> um, that's it. Um, okay, I'll tell you a bit about Panarays and about what we're doing to get you connected to the use case and what we're actually trying to solve. So basically, it states here that we're mapping the world's cybersecurity posture. But uh, what we're doing is automating third party security. And what that actually means. Uh, we are helping big organizations to actually manage the cybersecurity risk that is imposed by their suppliers. Uh, a lot of people actually talk about the target breach and the T-Mobile breach and Sony breach and Equifax, if you've heard of it lately. But uh, we can take an example of PNI Media, a small photo company that basically a hack to them hurt all of these big retailers. And when we're talking about suppliers and third parties, basically a lot of times you like to think about your IT vendors, your cloud service provider, your ERP system, CRM system, mailing services, and a lot of like integrated services that we have API with. But it's not only them. You can talk about financial services, you can talk about payrolls, law firms, accounting companies. And also one of our customers actually told us about his flower delivery company. And we we're like, what? And he's like, yes, they have a list of all of our high ranking employees, all of our most valuable customers with their names, addresses, phone numbers, and birth dates in which we actually assemble passwords out of. So it's pretty amazing to think that every breach, every supplier that we have might actually hold sensitive data. So the good question is, okay, so what do we do? Um, we look at the company in the hacker's point of view. And we're doing everything and providing dynamic ratings for our customers, knowing what's happening with their third party security posture. Uh, we're not installing anything in any party, not in the part of the evaluator and not in the part of the suppliers. And we're creating and mimicking the reconnaissance stage of the hacker of actually creating the attack surface of that specific organization that we're handling with. Uh, we're looking at the IT network lower level infrastructure of the supplier, also on the application layer, what's out facing, and on the human and behavioral side of that organization also. So again, we've talked about like the business case and the problem that we're trying to solve to our customers, but what we're doing technically, this is one of the important things. So 
what we used to do to actually do all of the scans and mimic the 10,000 hackers being uh, like running on a specific supplier is uh, for every one of the suppliers of our customers, we used to run a VM. Okay, how many of you basically use cloud service providers? AWS, Google, Azure, other vendors? Awesome, a lot of people. So you know what VMs are, okay? Virtual machines being launched. Uh, the parallelism would uh, used to be according to a company that we're scanning. So for every company that we're scanning, we used to launch a VM. And we've built an internal orchest orchestration system. How many of you have tried to do that? How fun is that? Not much, okay? And usually when you do that with Cron and Bash, you don't have any transparency and visibility on top of your processes as well. And everything, of course, infrastructure-wise, was running on Google Cloud. So, the problem. What's the hardest problem in software engineering? Cache and validation, okay. Good example. What else? Wow, I, I can't hear you. Nothing, okay. Naming things. This is true, okay? Most of the time wasted on actual like arguments about code is what's the name of variables. I really love this meme, I'm sorry. I just saw that, I'm sorry for the unfunny jokes. Uh, so because this is like a tech conference and everything, I need to talk about something scientific. So this is actual research had been done on Quora. And uh, this is like the opinion of most of the developers there, basically saying naming things is hard. So, simple steps to the actual solution. Uh, what do you do when you have a problem of naming? You appoint a CNO, okay? So please meet Tal. He's the CNO of Panarays. Uh, he's the go-to guy for all of your hardest problems. So once we have that off the table, uh, we can actually define the real problems that we're facing. So because we want to solve the actual problem and we want to tackle the real things that are bothering us, we need to define them as well as possible for us to solve it. So first of all, parallelism was happening in the manner of a company. I can do more, right? Um, and scanning the evaluation process wasn't that transparent. Everything should run and basically in the end we would check if everything was correct and I couldn't intervene in the middle of the process. Server utilization is low. Because we're doing a lot of scans and we're trying to mimic a lot of network activity, a lot of things are IO bound. And because of that, we have like really low CPU and memory utilization until we get to some kind of calculation. Um, again, it's hard to build an internal uh, kind of orchestration system if you've ever tried that. And how do you monitor all of that? Basically, you need some kind of API to control everything because you want to do everything as automatic as possible. And, of course, like every startup company, uh, how many of you have started your own startup company or at least your own internal project and created a monolith? Come on, guys, don't lie. Everybody are starting with a monolith. And, of course, we want to be smart, we want to be trendy, and we're creating microservices, right? So what you eventually end up with is a microlith. Okay, and this is basically what we ended up with that specific VM. So in the beginning, we had Bash and a virtual machine, lots of virtual machines, and everything used to run sequentially on a specific virtual machine. So the problems with that process, everything was super manual, sequential, wasteful, of course, in the matter of resources, and also very, very inflexible because we couldn't intervene in the middle of the process at all. Hi again. So the problems Demi pre just presented led to the birth of the transporter. The transporter is 100% Python and vegan friendly, since I'm vegan. So what is the transporter? or what, what was the goals when we first designed it. It leverages distributed task queue architecture and Kubernetes to allow both flexibility at the job level and efficiency to scale. It favors parallelism whenever possible and it provides an API for a fully automated pipeline. So in high level, whenever a company enters panorays, it triggers an API call to the transporter, which creates the 
workflow and the underlying tasks, sets the dependency of the tasks ac according to the predefined workflow, and deploys the jobs exactly in time and order to Kubernetes as a Kubernetes job. But before going to, into details of this very important new component, let's talk a bit about Kubernetes. Okay, how many of you actually know Kubernetes or Docker in general, like orchestration and the problems in the matter of it? Okay, so more than half of the people. So Kubernetes is a framework, an open source that uh, came out of Google. It is based on their own internal orchestration system called Borg. And uh, mainly it's written in Go, I think in almost 100%. And uh, it manages applications and not machines, okay? And basically the notion of launching VMs, I really don't care about that because I really want to only execute my own code. So what I do is package my own code and executables with Docker containers and let Kubernetes handle all of the uh, lift and shift of the, um, of the actual services and uh, like all of the best practices of running services with service discovery, et cetera, it handles it all because it's opinionated framework. And a lot of times when people talk about Kubernetes, they actually talk about all of these like terms and terminology in general. They talk in deployments, in long living services that are being run on our cluster, uh, services that are exposed to the outer world or only in the internal network of Kubernetes. Replica sets, right? We want replication, we want everything to be highly available pods, which are the fundamental parts being run on Kubernetes, and also volumes, because a lot of times we want state, we want to keep the data somewhere. And of course, in the matter of orchestration, and discovery and everything, they have labels, selectors, config maps, secrets. But a lot of times people don't look on the other side of Kubernetes, also being able to run batch operations, okay? And big data workloads as well. It's not only like running long living services, but short living tasks also can run on Kubernetes and even long living tasks. And this is the aspect that we're trying to assess right now. You're looking there at a job, okay? And this is something that Tal will elaborate in our solution also. Okay, so as with the original transporter, our transporter follows a few simple rules. The first rule is the transporter deal. The deal is you state the workflow, the transporter will make it happen. How do you define a, work, a workflow? Let's start by defining a job. A job is a task that needs to get done. A group of these jobs is a phase. A phase can be whether sequential or parallel. And the group, or more correctly, a sequence of these phases run one after another is a workflow. These abstractions allows for both parallelism whenever possible on the phase level and to set dependencies among job, which is classic for our use case. In our case, it's more similar to this kind of things. Each job is mapped to an actual code run in a, which runs in a container uh, and we set the dependencies and the corresponding workflow. The transporter uses a distributed ta task architecture, task queue architecture. In a distributed task queue architecture, tasks get created and transported to some queue. On the other side, there are workers who consume from these queues and perform the actual task. This architecture allows for retries when a task fails, to schedule tasks for later, and to set timeouts for long living tasks. Under the hood, we use Flask as a web framework to provide the REST API to manipulate workflows. Whenever we create a workflow, the transporter creates the tasks and set the dependencies according to the workflow. The tasks get transported to RabbitMQ. Again, the workers consume these tasks. Each task is actually contains code that deploys a Kubernetes job, which result in Kubernetes job running according to the order defined in the workflow exactly in time. And when you can do it parallel according to the phase, it runs in parallel. We also added some worker manipulation endpoints, so we can create, get the status, and scale down and up workers via the transporter API. But even with this awesome architecture, sometimes packages or containers get exploded, whether it's because of the bugs we have 
on the code inside the container. Sometimes Kubernetes fails to start the container. For these cases, we built a notification API layer, which sends us mails whenever a new workflow started, finishes successfully, or failed. <clears throat> so this container-based architecture requires our security researchers to build and push Docker images to a container registry. The transporter pulls the image according to labels, to the labels, and then deploy it to Kubernetes. When we first started working with Kubernetes jobs, we chose names which, are, which were the exact name as the original job, so it would be easy to track which job ra is running now. And this is how we encountered some Kubernetes naming limitations. The first one is regex for validating Kubernetes name. It basically says start and end with an alphanumeric character, and you can put dashes or underscores in the middle. The second limitation we've encountered is thanks to our security researchers who loves overly descriptive and really long names, um, and it's for maximum characters. So the first tip is use unique identifiers for names, but still we wanted to track down which job is running for which company. And for this, we use labels. So what's on our cluster in this new architecture? The coolest thing about the transporter is that it can run as a service on Kubernetes. Deploying, and it's, it's deploying Kubernetes job on the same cluster it sits on. So we have the transporter service, jobs that have been triggered by the transporter, workers that have been created using the transporter, and this Redis is just for salary as a backend. Uh, let's see a quick demo of the command line. Yeah, I'll just tell you what happens. So basically, we can see the, the Kubernetes cluster in Panorays. Uh, you can see here the, the two jobs are running. We have one worker, and we have the transporter service and the Redis, which was just described in the last slide. Now what we're going to do is to create a, a new workflow and see what happens. OK, so we, we just received the workflow ID of the new workflow. We can now send the GET request and see the workflow status. In this status, we can see uh, not only the workflow status, we can see all the tasks related to the workflow, and we can see which one succeeded or still pending. So we can see we got all the tasks related to the workflow. We can see most of them are pending, but we can see that two already succeeded. The, the other tasks are waiting for the second task to finish. So now let's try to create a worker using the transporter API. You, we can set using the transporter which queues we want to consume from. So this is a worker that consumes from all queues. We got the worker name, and now all that's left is just to see to check Kubernetes again, to see all the pods, and see whether we succeeded in uh, creating a new job and the worker. So this is the cluster of Kubernetes. We can see this is the new worker we've just created, and this is the job that runs now, and we set it 48 seconds ago. OK, so what's next? We, are already, we already built some uh, endpoints for monitoring on the transporter side, but we need to add a UI, because as you can see, it's not that pretty to look at the black screen. Um, next, we want to explicitly state versions of jobs instead of using Docker image labels. And the most important part is when we started the transporter project, we aimed for asset level par parallelization. When Demi presented our use case, we started by running all the jobs per company. But a company for us is just a group of assets, whether IPs or domains. And if all the jobs can run on a single asset, then the parallelization level can be much better. Um, and this is what we aim for. Currently, we, we are having some bottlenecks on the security research team. Um, but I guess by next time, we, we'll show you a better, uh, better project. 
Okay, so, so to conclude things, um, when you tackle any problem, okay, if you have the actual possibility of avoiding creating a distributed system, please do so. Okay, because this is one of the hardest things that you can actually try to do. A lot of people had implemented that in the past, maybe even Apache Spark or other distributed compute frameworks. Use them. Our use case didn't let us. Basically, when we started actually implementing things, we saw that we're trying to tackle the same problems that they used to tackle. Kubernetes is a great orchestration tool, okay? And why I'm saying that? Because most of the big vendors that are trying to adopt any orchestration framework are starting, starting to adopt Kubernetes. All the cloud service providers and also Docker as a company used, like started to adopt it to run its internal swarm that was or an orchestration framework. Um, again, it is possible to actually install Kubernetes on bare metal. So if you're not running on cloud, you are running in your own data centers, you can also do so with Kubernetes. There is a guide by Kelsey Heidhauer, if you'd like, that basically states Kubernetes the hard way. This is a, a manual that you can actually process and try to install it yourself, and a lot of companies do so. And as Tal stated, we have some lackings in our solution, but perfect is the real enemy of actually working or at least giving value to our customers. So you need to think about that a lot of times when you're trying to solve something. So again, we deployed something, we will improve that in a matter of time. And one other thing that we tried actually to tackle is the integration between security researchers and the engineering team, because a lot of times there is no uh, overlap in that, okay? A lot of times there is a handoff, but security researchers at our company also develop production code. So by that we created a kind of mechanism that instead of deploying uh, an actual VM, which took us in a matter of like all of the process of CI, CD and testing and everything, when I say D of course is deployment, uh, is uh, delivery and not deployment. And uh, the whole process took an hour and a half, around an hour and a half. Instead of that, we shortened the lifespan of that to actually deploying that specific Docker container that I need to improve or to upgrade or to fix a bug, and that's it. And we run everything to the transporter according to what's the, like the latest version on GCR. After we spoke really, really fast, probably your faces are like this. So if there are any questions, please do so. Okay, the question was, is the transporter open source? No. Do you want it to be? <laughs> yeah? So talk to me later and let's start a project. Awesome. Guys, thank you very much. It was great talking to you.